Did the different human races evolve separately or were they created as one human family? An interview with author and speaker Dr. Carl Whelan today on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Calvin Smith. And I'm Richard Fangrad. And this week we're going to be talking about um, One Human Family, which is a, a fantastic book that uh, Dr. Carl Wieland has written. Uh, One Human Family, The Bible, Science, Race, and Culture. And we actually have Dr. Wieland in the studio with us today. And we're really excited to have you here, Carl. Welcome. Uh, Thank you. I, I read this book. It took me five days to read this one. Uh, <laughs> but I it's a little bit bigger. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love this book. It was just great. I mean, a lot of um, you know books uh, on creation evolution. You know, they, they strictly stick to the scientific aspects, and there's lots of that in your book. But you really o opened up the the social uh, aspects of this uh, this subject as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could start us off there and, and tell us why you wrote this book and and, and how that well, comes together. Apart from the fact that you know, I've always found people to be the most fascinating part of God's creation uh, and I guess uh, you know I'm one of them. Uh, it's the fact that so many people don't understand um, the connection between the creation evolution issue and this whole issue of, of race and racism and so on and it's not as simple as saying that you know well we're all related which we are because we all go back to Adam and Eve and even closer than that to Noah and his family about four and a half thousand years ago, I mean that's important, but it's not a question of okay we all shake hands and understand that and all the problems of race and racism. Kumbaya. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, you know, so I wanted to do something which incorporated things like, you know, everything, language, you know, IQ, culture, all, all of those things because we all know, you know, we, we can say and it's true that, you know, biblically there's only one race, the human race, but we don't want to be all PC and say, well, you know, there's no such thing as race because if there was no such thing, if it didn't convey some sort of a meaning, right. and we all know what we mean by that, then there'd be no such thing as racism. You've, you've just defined racism out of existence. Right. And we know that people still have all these assumptions that one group of people is inferior to some other group. And it's also interesting that it's not, n not as simple as saying that, you know, evolution caused racism because there was tremendous racism in self-consciously biblical cultures like right. the Africana Society of South Africa or the antebellum South in the United States. And it's interesting that uh, the things they have in common, all forms of racism, is not so much evolution, but all of those sort of even pre-Darwinian ideas um, that were used to justify racism they have one thing in common. What is it? It's the rejection of the Genesis history mm. of the one human family origin of mankind. Mm. The fact that we are all related and that means, you know, even back when people were saying that our Australian Aborigines, for instance, were living missing links and sending specimens to Northern Hemisphere museums and killing them and robbing their graves and things like this in the name of evolutionary science, instead of being bluffed by that, and particularly the church, you know, it, they should have all made a stand and said, wait a minute, the Bible is the word of God. It tells us that we're all astonishingly closely related. We have to be. And if science doesn't know that, that means it's still got some catching up to do. Right. And if they'd done that, then they would have seen now that science has caught up and agrees that we are all astonishingly right. closely related. Yeah. But even though racism was around before Darwin, Darwin certainly influenced racist attitudes. What was, what's the connection there between racism and Darwin? Well, let me first establish that, you know, as staunch an anti-creationist as Professor Stephen Jay Gould of Harvard University, the late Prof Gould, yeah. he said that, uh, you know, biological theories of racism might have been common before 1850, right. uh, which is roughly when Darwin published his book. But they were 
increased by orders of magnitude. What he means is 10, 100, 1,000 fold yeah. following the acceptance of Darwinism. In other words, there's no doubt that Darwinism gave a turbo boost to racism, but what were these pre-Darwinian theories? Right. And there's some interesting stuff there, you know. You have, for instance, the Greek idea that was added to the Bible of the natural scale or the scala natura, where you divided all of nature up into simple to complex and you put them in an ascending scale, like rocks at the bottom and then simple creatures and yeah, then right higher now. creatures and then apes, people. And if you're a Christian culture, you wove into that angels and then God right at the top. Okay, yeah. Now that wasn't an evolutionary order. Things didn't turn one into the other but it was a natural, ready-made mental construct into which Darwinism could be subsequently fitted. Add to that the Greek idea that everything has to be smooth and perfect that, that the gods or God made, and then you have this belief that there must be in-between forms there, such as, you know, people right. started predicting that there'd be men with tails found <laughs> in the Americas. And in, lo and behold, explorers, you know, came back and gave people what they wanted to hear. Yes, we saw men with tails. Yeah, wow. Well, but n now they didn't actually find humans with tails, though, right? No, but they, al <laughs> no. they also anticipated that there would be people that looked like humans, but had no, okay. re no religion, no morals, no nothing. They were the ultimate savage. And the literature of the 16th and 17th century was full of the discovery of these, and in this case, they applied that to people they found, like the Khoisan, used to be called Hottentots, and the Inuit, and the Amerindians, and so on, and they were called wild beasts, and our own Tasmanian Aborigines wow. were regarded as wild beasts whom it is lawful to extirpate. Wow. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Yeah, and we'll be right back with more. In 2004, New Scientist magazine published an open letter to the scientific community in which 33 leading scientists blasted the Big Bang. Their strongly worded letter included statements like, The Big Bang today relies on a growing number of hypothetical entities, things that we have never observed. Without them, there would be a fatal contradiction between the observations made by astronomers and the predictions of the Big Bang theory. But the Big Bang theory can't survive without these fudge factors. An open exchange of ideas is lacking in most mainstream conferences and doubt and dissent are not tolerated. With such growing dissension from secular scientists, it's unfortunate that many Christian leaders have embraced the Big Bang, especially when there are so many contradictions between it and the Bible's account of creation in Genesis. And Genesis is the word of the Creator who witnessed creation, unlike any scientist. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. If you just tuned in, we're talking with the author of One Human Family, Dr. Carl Whelan, today on Creation Magazine Live. Yes. Now, one of the things you'd mentioned before is that pre-Darwinian racism was always the result of a rejection of Genesis, the Genesis account in the Bible, right? Uh, how you've got to really reject that one human family mm. uh, concept. But um, you, you had a quote by uh, Stephen Gould where he said, okay, well, there was racism before that. Uh, before Darwinism, but after Darwinism, then it just, it just, you know. Took off. Yeah, it took There's off. There's a good reason why it took off, because you see, um, evolution explains the differences between different groups of people as the result of having been separated for tens of thousands of years and evolving separately. Right. And because evolution has no fixed speed or direction, that's a great excuse for saying that, you know, the next person's group is less highly advanced than your own. Right. And uh, so all of a sudden people had this, you know, scientific justification for their, for their, you know, beliefs and prejudices and so on. And rather than relying on Aristotle or some ancient Greeks and whatever. And, you know, many people today, they say, well, Darwin wasn't a racist and so on. But, you know, he really was. I mean, Professor Peter Bowler, who features in our Year of Darwin Voyage That Shook the World. Yes. He's an anti-creationist, uh, but he's an expert on Darwin, and uh, he said this on the movie. He said, the non-white, this is according to Darwin, the non-white races simply do not have the capacity to be elevated properly into civilized human beings, <laughs> and that Darwin thought that they were mentally and morally at a more limited level. In a sense, they are stuck at an early stage in the biological evolution of the human species. And Thomas Huxley, who was Darwin's bulldog, um, you know, his evangelist, if you like, said no rational man, cognizant of the facts, 
believes that the average Negro is the equal, still less the superior of the white man. Wow, that's uh, that's pretty blatant yeah, in, in, in his admission um, of what he considered incredible. Now, now eugenics is another another topic that's related to this. What's that all about? How does it relate to well, this an, larger an, discussion? It's an offshoot of Darwinism by Francis Galton, which was Darwin's cousin. And it basically says that we've got to improve humanity by making sure that only superior types of people breed. Mm, yeah. And uh, eugenics was really huge uh, in North America as well before the Second World War. You know, there were 60,000 US citizens were forcibly sterilized. And there were even so, so, so some of them were actually killed. There was, a, there was a book written by an investigative journalist called Edwin Black, sort of War Against the Weak, which documents all sorts of horrible things that most people don't even know about. And they don't know that American and British scientists were actually cheering on the Nazis in the years leading up to the World War II. Wow. Yeah, that's one thing you point out in your book too, is this Darwin-Hitler connection. And, uh, you know, many, many evolutionists will try to reject that, but yes. it's there. Yeah. Well, my own mother was brought up, and this has come through in the book, there's a, a lot of personal things in there, because my own mother was brought up under the Nazis. Right. And she was a gentle soul, but she was sucked in by all of this science and all the rest of it into thinking that, that, that it was a good thing to have, you know, the very weak people that were very, you know, mentally disabled and so on, uh, you know, put to sleep. I mean, you know, good people were sucked in all over the place, you know, into supporting apartheid, slavery, and things like this. And of course, the church, over and over, instead of making a stand on our one human family Genesis history, has sort of said, oh, you know, well, we better accept what all these scientists are saying. But it's been shown that they were totally wrong. Right. We are actually astonishingly closely related. And my mother remembers, for instance, uh, people standing on the main streets in Germany holding banners saying, we are sorry, we have sinned against natural selection. Wow. What did they mean for allowing inferior races yeah. and so on to breed according to how they defined it? It's amazing thinking about the, uh, the implications of this topic, uh, both uh, in history and in the present. And we'll be right back with some more. What are the theological consequences of adding millions of years to Genesis? How does it impact doctrines such as the gospel, sin, the atonement? Refuting compromise is the most powerful biblical and scientific defense of a straightforward view of Genesis. Loaded with scientific support for a recent creation in six real days, it demolishes all attempts to twist the biblical text in order to insert millions of years, bringing clarity into an area usually mired in confusion. Must reading for Bible college students and anyone involved in church leadership or teaching. Get your copy at creation.com. Welcome back to Creation Magazine Live. We're talking to Dr. Carl Wieland, author of One Human Family. And uh, yeah, you know, we were talking about the first how this is a, a comprehensive book, but it's a very easy read. Uh, you know, just a, yes. a, a page turner, in fact. It covers yeah. a lot of, lot of topics it related sure to this issue. Yeah. Now, obviously, you're uh, from Australia. You talk funny. <laughs> I'm the only guy in the room without an accent. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I was so excited when I visited Australia. I told all my audiences, hey, I finally have an accent. Uh, anyway, um, now, <laughs> in your book, you, you talk about how the Aboriginal, uh, uh, Australian Aborigines were affected by this, you know, obviously, uh, racism and things like that. And just get you to talk about that. Darwin and his colleagues uh, regarded them as living missing links. And, uh, you know, many of their graves were robbed and many of them were deliberately murdered. Uh, in order to send the specimens to Northern Hemisphere museums in the name of science. Wow. And uh, that sort of social Darwinism, I mean, sort of people say, well, it's all history now, but one reason is because of the Nazi death camps. You know, people suddenly mm. saw where it all heads to and it became distinctly unfashionable. But let me say that, that the racism is really underground. The a average Australian looks at the fact that in the Aboriginal communities there's a lot of alcoholism, there's a lot of illiteracy, a lot of welfare dependency and so on. And I don't think Australia is unique in those sorts of problems. You know, the book sort of grapples head on with these yeah. things. It's not some PC whitewash. But it, um, the average Australian thinks, well, that's just the way they are. I mean, that's, you know, they just aren't as good as us or as smart as us or, yeah. or something like that. And my own daughter sort of brought up the way she was, obviously, the creationist father. Uh, she became a doctor in Aboriginal communities and she uh, saw this illiteracy problem and 
she didn't for one minute accept that it was due to some sort of a biological inferiority. So she and her husband, they took Aboriginal boys into their home during the school term and gave them a peaceful, loving, disciplined environment and uh, a chance to learn without the violence and alcoholism and so on. And uh, the first one they took in, for instance, he was functionally illiterate in year six of school, couldn't read or write properly, and within one year of the right environment, he topped the class, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. and, and that was, that was a class uh, right outside the Aboriginal community. So how, how real is this concept of racism? What, what does science say about, the, uh, about DNA and so on? Well, look, you know, it's, uh, it's been said and there's been statements by scientists that, you know, the word race has no more biological meaning and so on, but we are astonishingly close. I don't go so far as to say we should do away with the word race because I think race still has an everyday meaning. We know what we mean. Right. And you can be so PC that, you know, you become unreal. Plus, if you look at enough genes, you can work out which group people belong to simply because you're more closely related to your extended family than you are to me. Right. So there's different degrees of relatedness. But let me explain just how close we are. You can take two people from the most different looking groups on earth, the Khoisan, little bushmen of the Kalahari as they used to be called in Swedes, for example, tall and blonde and take an average one of those and an average one of those, the genetic distance between them on average is less than the distance between one Chinese person who traditionally speaks Hakka and the other one who speaks Hokkien, you know, and who look the same. And uh, we're all just a series of closely overlapping circles. So the idea of, you know, big racial differences and so on, it's just not there. So right. science knows nothing of that. Knows nothing of that. I'm, I mean, when, when you look at things like skin color and eye color and so on, people think separately evolved gene for, for blue paint in your eyes. Right. But there's yeah. no blue paint in your eyes. It's <laughs> just the same brown stuff as gives you the color of your skin and your hair and all, all the rest of it. You know, blue eyes is just an optical effect from the light scattering from the little bit of melanin. Yeah. And in fact, it's now believed that blue eyes are almost certainly the result of a mutation, mutation yeah. early in human yeah. history, like a loss of information. Yeah. So are you saying blonde-haired, blue-eyed people are more mutated than... Uh... <laughs> well, uh, you know, sometimes when I'm giving a talk, I talk about how the information for more melanin in your skin gives you, you know, dark brown skin, which people call black, and a little bit, you know, light brown, which people call white, isn't white, you know. Um, and the same with the color of your eyes and your hair, brown or black hair versus blonde hair. And, um, and then I say, am I saying that blue-eyed blondes have less information? And everybody <laughs> cracks up, and particularly in places like Singapore, they, they love it. Yeah. <laughs> Great stuff. We'll be back with more in just a minute. Calling someone a mutant is an insult because mutations, which are copying mistakes in DNA, are almost always bad. In fact, we know many mutations by the diseases that they cause. And to make matters worse, more mutations are added to the human genome each generation. In his recent book, Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome, former Cornell University professor John Sanford points out the seriousness of this problem. He shows that mutations are rapidly decaying the information within the human genome. However, this is surprising because according to evolutionary theory, mutations coupled with natural selection is the means by which new information arises. But according to Sanford, if mutation and selection cannot preserve the information already within the genome, it's difficult to imagine how it could have created all that information in the first place. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Welcome back. We're talking with Dr. Carl Wieland about his book, One Human Family. Right. Now, Carl, uh, talking about the, the science side of this, um, you know, concepts like natural selection, I mean, uh, Darwinist evolutionists, you know, kind of use this as a you know, this is the magic superpower that's going to turn one thing into another and things like that. How, um, how does natural selection play out when we talk in terms of, you know, words like racist? Natural selection is a fact, but natural selection doesn't create things. It culls genes, gets yeah. rid of things. And uh, when you look at the origin of the races uh, from the point of view of biblical history, um, 
you, you've got a situation at Babel where God creates separate groups of languages quickly. He doesn't create this 800 languages of Papua New Guinea in one head, but probably 12, 15, 20 languages, which later on become the stem languages of today's language families. Right. The end effect is that you break up one gene pool into lots of smaller gene pools. So each group takes a subset of those genes, and I often use the analogy like dealing a hand of bridge. Everybody gets hearts, but some get more hearts, some get less hearts. Right. Let's take hearts as the analogy for the genes for darkness of skin. So if you have more hearts, you have you know darker skin. Um, now, if one group's got slightly darker skin than another group, and they both migrate off towards the sunlit areas of equatorial Africa, well, then the dark skin group will do better. Why? They get less skin cancer, less sunburn, less eye cancer, less tropical diseases like your, yours, because uh, melanin has been shown to protect against that. Melanin also yeah. protects against the breakdown of the B vitamin folic acid. And so the lighter skin group will either die out or migrate back because they're uncomfortable. And so that's the reason why you will have darker skinned people in an equatorial region. Right. And then also uh, there's a self-selection process. If you're in a group that's predominantly dark or light skinned and a baby is born which tends in the other direction, then that baby will be seen more as an outlier and different mm. and might find it harder to get a marriage partner and, and things like this. So you get all these effects happening. Equally, if a dark skinned group and a light skinned group go towards the poorly sunlit areas like Scandinavia and Scotland and places like this, the dark skinned group will do less well because they won't get enough sunshine to make vitamin D yeah. into their skin. So they'll have bone diseases and things like this. Yeah. So natural selection doesn't create the differences, it fine tunes them to the environment. It's just fascinating that, that with an understanding of, of biblical history, the way we read it there in Genesis, and some basic natural selection we can understand, we can explain as Christians, the distribution of different skin colors around the world. It's fascinating. Yeah, exactly. What's the effect on culture? You have, you have uh, different skin colors in different cultures. You also talk about that in your book. Well, culture is, a, is an important thing, and it's not just, I'm not just talking folk songs and things like this, I'm talking right. to the subtle effects that we absorb from our entire environment all, all the time. See, if I can look at two situations that are real on the world today and that cause racial tensions, right, yeah. that have been misinterpreted as racial. One is, if you look back to the days of the British Malaya, before there was Malaysia, the British planters of the rubber plantations, they would pay a Chinese worker twice as much as a Malay worker. Why? Because they could get three times as much work out of the Chinese worker. Why was that? Well, the Chinese thought it was because the Malays were chronically lazy uh, and biologically different. But in fact, if you look at the background and the history, the Chinese came from a culture where there was a lot of hardships and famines and so on. So work, work, work was an essential thing. And it's even seen today in the way you know the kids are pushed at school and so on. The Malays came from a background where there was always fertile soil, lots of rainfall. You didn't have to, you know, do a lot of work to to avoid being hungry. And uh, so the Chinese ended up owning all the businesses. And the Malays thought the Chinese were biologically greedy and grasping. <laughs> and a similar thing happened in Fiji with Indians and the native Fijians. You know, for the Fijian, the coconut would just drop from the tree, and there was always a fish in the lagoon. Uh, and the Indians didn't have that. So there's the same sorts of racial tensions that, that have built up in Fiji and the same feeling that the other group is somehow biologically different and biologically bad for right, us. Right, you know? right. That's another aspect of this, this uh, whole racism, one family mm. issue. And we'll be back with more in just a moment. Everyone likes to get things for free. Thanks to donors at Creation Ministries International, we have put great effort into making huge amounts of faith-building information freely available online. Creation.com now has more than 8,000 articles. Some of CMI's most popular books are in PDF format to read online for free. All 48 episodes of Creation Magazine Live and other teaching videos are online at no charge. Consider making a donation, enabling us to continue producing free faith-building information. 
Welcome back. To, we're talking to Dr. Carl Wieland, author of One Human Family. Carl, I really appreciated your book because you didn't shy away from tough issues, even for Christians. Uh, obviously, you're a Christian, um, but you know you, you explain that Christians have been involved in racist attitudes, and and they look for justification in the Bible for their attitudes. Yeah. And and one of them was, of course, this so-called curse of Ham. Um, can you share a little bit about that? Well, of course, if you're a Christian, say, in the antebellum U.S. South, and you're looking for a justification, why are we enslaving these people who should be our relatives, right. you know, and it says in the Constitution that all men are created equal and so on. How do you justify that? Well, you, you do it by saying that, you know, we were all created equal, but then some of us got zapped. <laughs> and, and that's ah. this curse on yeah. ham myth. You know the belief that Noah cursed his grandson Ham, and that caused the black his son Ham, and that caused the black skin, and so on. Right. The Bible knows nothing about a curse on Ham. Noah's curse was on Canaan, who was his grandson. Yeah. Says nothing about skin color. And if you are looking for fulfilment of that curse in history, then maybe you look at what happened to the Canaanites. Uh, but even so, I think we need to remember one extra thing, and that there's no indication in the Bible that Noah's pronouncement had any sort of a divine favor or imprimatur or authority on it. So right. why should it come true anyway? Right. Um, if uh, you want to know more about uh, Carl's book, you can go to our website, creation.com. We've got a whole web store there, and you can uh, certainly order that. Um, I just find it, found it a fascinating read. Um, anything else you'd like to add? I mean, obviously, you, you've written this book for Christians, um, and, and racism is still alive. Why do you think the Bible is, has yeah. the answer, Carl? Well, because we see throughout history that uh, wherever people have tried to justify the uh, sinful attitudes of racism, putting down another person because of some intrinsic, you know, belonging to a group or something like that, uh, they've had to distort the Genesis history of one human family, whether that's in Christian or non-Christian cultures alike. And, you know, for instance, one of the classic ideas was to, in a Christian culture, was to invent other groups of people apart from Adam and Eve. Right. right. You know, and therefore sort of our group came from Adam and Eve and therefore we're superior. Right. But the Bible has always taught that God made from one man all nations of men. Right. Well, this has been a great, uh, Good great stuff. time with yeah. you. Uh, yeah. Appreciate you coming out and uh, encourage people to check out Carl's book, One Human Family, available at creation.com. Thanks a lot, Carl. Appreciate it.